I remember I got uh, stranded at the airport in Chicago, if you remember. <laughs> yeah. I got stuck. I got stuck yesterday, but luckily we didn't have a meeting in the evening, so I still made it. It seems like there are always storms. Well, actually, the presentation I'm going to be making this morning, the first one and the second one, Pastor Jared said, this is what I would like you to do. So uh, this is what I am going to do. I am obedient, and uh, this is uh, what uh, uh, also God has put on my heart to share with you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just pray that... uh, Uh, You will speak through me, that you will uh, uh, just uh, dominate the place, and that all of us, we will feel your grace, your warmth, and your love. And thank you, Lord, for all of my friends. I pray that you will bless them and their families. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I do a lot of uh, research trying to find out about what makes some churches grow and some churches don't grow. And there are many, many factors. Obviously, evangelism is one of them, but there are maybe another 10, 20 other factors. It depends on how you classify them. The atmosphere of the church is one of them, leadership, ministry. But uh, one of the interesting things was Uh, we started to ask people about who is the most effective evangelist in the world. So uh, give me names of some effective evangelists that you know about. Okay, Dennis Preby. Holy Spirit, obviously, you know, yes. You know, that's the ultimate. Everything happens by the Holy Spirit, yes. Doug Batchelor, okay. Anything else comes to your mind? Oh, <laughs> thank you very much for not spoiling it. <laughs> Walter Weitz, okay. So somebody, uh, we're going to have people on both sides, so I have to pay attention to both sides. So somebody actually, his name was Wynn, W-I-N-N, Arn, in 1969 asked the question, how do people come to know Jesus and join the church? I mean, I'm sure other people have asked that question, but this guy put a survey to it. So here is uh, what uh, he, uh, he put together. Um, what percentage of people come to their new relationship with Christ and their church through each category. So here are the categories this guy put. Interestingly enough, with some modification, this survey have been done over a million people over all over the world. So it was done in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Australia, Africa. Special needs means uh, you have a crisis in your life. You lose your job. You get cancer. Uh, you, you lose uh, money, whatever it is. A walk-in, uh, there is a phenomena about, we, uh, another word for it is divine appointment where God leads some people to the church. Uh, Like what happened with uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, The pastor, that's somebody like me. Visitation, that's like somebody like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons do. Sabbath school. And then uh, evangelistic meetings, that's what like Doug Batchelor or Sean Boonstra do. And then the last category is church programs. Uh, Everything you can think about in church, uh, uh, that the church does in in terms of programs. So tell me, what do you think? What percentage came to know Jesus and joined the church as a result of special needs? 
Think with me. What do you think? 40%. Do you think that's low? Okay, let's go 50, 60. Okay. Uh, do you agree with him? Oh, we agree with him. Okay. Uh, what about walk in? Ten percent. Okay. Uh, the pastor. Twenty percent. Fifty. I like that figure better because I am a pastor. <laughs> Uh, visitation, 40%. You're way over three, 400 so far. So don't worry about your... <laughs> okay, Sabbath school. I didn't hear it. 10%. Evangelistic meetings. 7 for, uh, you are so precise now you were uh, more <laughs> general <laughs> more okay what is it 40% okay what about church programs that would be high what give me a figure at least 30 okay i want to tell you every figure you gave me was wrong. Every figure. We have to start all over again. Okay, let's see. And I'm going to prove it to you. One to, uh, one to 2% are for special needs. Now that is a shocker, right? Yeah. By the way, this was the Sabbath school maybe eight years ago. Uh, I wrote the Sabbath school eight, eight, nine years ago. I forgot. Walk in two to three percent. Pastor, five to six percent. Visitation, one to two percent. The reason there is a range is the lowest and the highest. Sabbath school, 4 to 5 percent. Uh, the Sabbath school really is, in, at least in our church, is effective especially with kids. Evangelistic meetings, 5 percent. Uh, is this a, a surprise? And uh, church program is 3 to 4 percent. Well, so, uh, you know, uh, you, you were very much interested in math. So add them all up. About 25. So where do the rest come from? Friends and relatives, 75 to 90%. Friends, I want to tell you, there is a misconception when you uh, mention who is the most effective evangelist in the world, the name Doug Batchelor comes to mind, when in reality you are the most effective evangelist in the world. 75 to 90% of all of the people who come to know Jesus come as a result of relationship. Okay, I'd like somebody to come and help me with this. At least if you could volunteer to come over here. All right. So I'd like you to count everybody who is here, and including you and me. Thirty 32. people. Thirty th and what, what about him? I counted. Okay, thirty-two people. Okay, so if the primary influence 
No, because I need you to tell me. Okay, just in case I miss somebody. Okay. If the primary influence in your conversion experience is a special needs, raise your hand. What do you, what do you see? Zero here. If the primary influence in your conversion experience is walk in, raise your hand. Zero, right? Got one. Uh, what, what happened to you? Yeah. Yeah. So her parents had an influence on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that will be church programs also. But we'll give you one for that. Okay. Yeah. The pastor. Wow. Please somebody raise your hand so we could justify our salaries. <laughs> Not one individual for the pastor. <laughs> okay, visitation. Zero, right? We only got one so far out of 33 because I saw somebody else coming in. Okay, the Sabbath school. None. Evangelistic meeting, okay. One, there should be more than one. Yeah, so just you, one. So that's two out of 33. But I know him and he actually came with his relatives, so. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, church programs. What was it? Uh, it's written. Okay, church program. Absolutely. Now we're up to almost 35. Uh, friends and relatives, just raise your hand. Friends, I want to tell you, no matter what you do, no matter where you are, the most effective evangelist in the world is you. Thank you very much. Now you can go and sit down. Yes. The, Look at the pastor's face. <laughs> so I uh, took this and adapted it and did it in the Adventist church. 1,600 Seventh-day Adventist churches participated in this study. The major adaptation was in the evangelical study, they only allowed them to put one factor we said put as many factors as you want. Because maybe you grew up in the church, but the influence of the teacher or the influence of the pastor or influence of the youth leader or an evangelist. The other thing that we discovered a couple of surprises, and I'm going to ask you about it. So this is the Adventist study. And this is about eight years old. Those who said they were brought up in an Adventist home, 60%. Those who said a friend or relative brought them to Christ was 60%. Notice number four, Bible study in my home, 34%. Somebody visiting me, I have relationship with that. If you add number one, number two, and number four, you come up after you remove the duplication in the computer, you come up with 77%, which is exactly the same as this one here. Here is one of the surprises. Notice number three, a public evangelism series of meetings in the Adventist church was 36%, and the evangelical study was 5%. We, 
Why do you think the discrepancy? That's a big change between 5 to 36. Okay? And I think that's part of it. We have more of a systematic way, comprehensive way of looking at life. But it's specifically prophecy. A lot of Christians, especially unchurched Christians, would like to know more about prophecy, and we present it in a very clear way. So that's one. Other churches don't approach that. What else? Well, that's probably a very good point, too. Yes. I would say the biggest one is that we do it more often. Almost every Adventist church will do it once a year or once every two years. And we do a better job in follow-up than other churches. Another surprise, at least that's for me, uh, Reading books, journal, or literature was 50%. So that means people still read. Maybe uh, that includes the internet. I don't know, but they still read. The, the internet is 7%. Probably now is much higher because I said this was done before COVID. So that, that's definitely. Okay, here is very interesting thing. Others. Under others, number one was my wife. My wife was 600 times higher than my husband. There were some people who said my husband, but the wife was much higher than the husband. 600%, that means 600 times higher. Here's another thing. When we ask who was the greatest, who had the greatest influence spiritually on you, the mother got 40%, the father got 19%. Now, it could be because historically the father was working and the mother stayed home. That's a little bit changing now. But I still believe uh, women are more effective in evangelism than men. Um, for a couple reasons. I think women tend to have deeper relationship with other people. Men, if, if you have a group of men getting together, they talk about cars or sports. They are not going to talk about their feeling. But if you have women getting together, they talk about their feeling. The other thing is the church is about 55% women, so that means women have a little bit more heart for God than men. Number two under others was my teacher. Do we have any teacher who teach at the school here? All right, my teacher. You know, uh, this one, I made a mistake because I really wished I put church school as a category by itself. Because if you don't put it as a category, people don't think about it. But people did think about it, and 22% uh, said my wife and my teacher. It's a very high percent. Number three was my pathfinder. Do we have any pathfinder leaders here? Oh, we have several here, yeah. What is the common denominator between my wife or my husband, my teacher, and my pathfinder. Mostly women, that's true. <laughs> well, but relationship, that's what it is. It's about relationship, really. It's about connection, uh, about uh, you know, uh, knowing each other and investing our time in, into each other. Uh, we ask... Uh, this is actually in addition to the information you have in the book because this is more 
current research of this year, we asked 50 young men who stayed in the church and 50 young women separately. Why are you in the church? Guess what was the number one answer that we got in almost like 98% of all of them? What was it? What kept me in the church? I'm going to give you four reasons why they stayed in the church, but by far number one was It was, I have a mentor. Which is relationship. I have a mentor. Somebody, here's the definition we ask. Somebody who keeps track of me. Somebody who loves me. Somebody who prays with me. Somebody who helped me make choices in life. Somebody who when I am hurting, I could go to. When I'm struggling with life, they help me with that. I have three questions for you. Who is your Barnabas? Because what made Paul acceptable to the church was the mentoring that was done to him by Barnabas. Barnabas took the time invested his life in Paul. And now we have 16 books in the Bible as a result of that. But not only that, who is your Timothy? So Paul, who was mentored by Barnabas, invested his life in the life of a young pastor. Actually, three times in the Bible, three times, Paul, writes to three people and says, you are my beloved son in the Lord. He said that to Titus, to Timothy, and to Onesimus, three people. He became a spiritual father to those three people. A friend of mine and I sat in my living room and we read all of the letters of the Apostle Paul, all the way from the first chapter of Romans all the way to the end of Hebrews. And uh, I would read and my friend would write how many times the Apostle Paul was praying for people, 44 times, 44 he, uh, he's always praying for people. Now, you have to remember this guy, Paul, was a church planter, was a theologian, was an itinerant evangelist and a pastor. But yet he remembered people from all of the churches he planted. I mean, to me, it was amazing. Uh, I can't even remember all of the people in the church I pastored. And, and you remember people in Rome and in Athens and in Corinth, and he prayed for them. Here is one prayer I would like to share with you, which is very much related to this. Go with me to Philemon. <clears throat> So Philemon was a new convert. And it's only one chapter, this epistle. And I'm going to read verses 4 to 7. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. Notice, he's praying for him all the time. I make mention of you in my prayers. Hearing of your love and faith 
which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective to the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. The, uh, Paul is telling him, I am praying for you that when you share your faith, you will become effective. I really believe that is the role of the leaders of the church, elders, deacons, Sabbath school, to always pray for other people to have effectiveness in sharing their faith. Um, Paul was a mentor to Timothy. How did he become a mentor to him? For instance, how did Paul know that the greatest influence spiritually in the life of Timothy was his mother and his grandmother? How did he know that? That's right. He hung out with him. He said, let's go for a walk. Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your family. That's how he got to know him. He never said, I don't have time. Look, I am a theologian. I am a pastor. I am a church planter. I have to write a defense in front of the king. He took the time. The third question I have is, who is your Silas? Because remember, Paul and Silas were kind of equal caliber, were doing ministry together, at least in uh, Philippi. They got in jail. They were uh, praying and praising God. And you know the rest of the story. Three people should be always in our lives. Somebody who will mentor us, somebody that we could mentor, and somebody that we mentor each other. Here is another thing we discover from this study. No matter how you come to the Lord in any of these categories, the first six months are the most crucial in the life of the new believer. In the first six months, if the atmosphere of the church is not healthy and you have three friends or acquaintances or less, the probability of leaving the church is 80%. But if the atmosphere is healthy and filled with grace and love and the new believer has seven or more friends, the probability of staying in the church is 80%. I mean, that's a swing of 160%. That's amazing. Any question before I move on? Okay. Yes, all done by survey. And we, we showed that here, by the way. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, give me some biblical examples of what I am talking about now. Yes. Ruth and Naomi is a perfect example from the Old Testament. Yes. That's a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Esther and Mordecai. Mordecai was the mentor to Esther. Yes. Joshua and Moses. By the way, uh, this is a significant story, especially about the mentoring part. So Moses was mentored by his father-in-law, Jethro. And he mentored Joshua. But Joshua, as far as we know, didn't mentor anybody. And where do we have the book of Judges? Everything fell apart. 
Paul, when he wrote, in fact, I'll read it for you. Second, it's easy to remember. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2 Timothy 4. Uh, it shows you the importance of what we are talking about. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things which you have heard from me among many witnesses commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He is creating a culture of mentoring. In fact, not only that, in Titus, he wrote to Titus chapter 2, he said, I want the older woman to mentor the younger woman, and I want the older men to mentor the younger men. And that is in faith and in other aspects like leadership, but specifically in faith. Okay, give me a couple examples from the New Testament. Jesus and John and the, the disciple, definitely. What about in terms of evangelism? Peter, uh, so who brought Peter? Andrew brought Peter. Come and see. Here is some example. Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. Uh, Philip brought his friend Nathaniel. The Samaritan woman told her whole town about her encounter with Jesus. And this one was unbelievable. The whole town came. Uh, you have several of them. But I'm going to uh, give you some uh, principle and then a story. And the best story I reserve to the last. So I will tell two stories. Um, the principles are very, very simple. Number one is pray a lot that God will lead you to somebody that you could witness to or you could mentor. Just pray about it. Number two, have what I call evangelistic eyes and evangelistic uh, ministry and, uh, uh, you know, whatever you could do to help that, either in through evangelism or through ministry. Evangelistic eyes and ministry eyes. Number three, always build relationship. Nothing will happen without relationship. Nothing. And then stay with them for the long haul. So in our church, a couple of years ago, our pastor stood up and he said, we sent cards to our community asking if they would like to study the Bible. We got a bunch of cards back. And we took care of most of them, but we still have four or five left. If you are interested, come and take one of those cards. If you don't know how to give a Bible study, I will teach you. So I went and picked up one of the cards. Uh, I didn't really look at that card till later on. And then when I looked at it, it was a name of a woman. And I didn't feel uncomfortable going by myself to her house. Uh, and my wife was not available at that time. So I called her and I said, could you come to the church? Oh, she said, sure, I will come, no problem. So she started coming over to the church and I studied the Bible with her and she got baptized. Now I am in the habit of visiting the people I baptize the day after their baptism to cast the vision for them to bring their family and friends to Christ. So I went to their house, or her house, the following day. This is the first time I ever have been to her house. And it was a very, very nice house. And I went inside, and I looked at the walls. My ministry and evangelistic eyes saw something. I saw pictures of her husband all over the walls, fishing. He had a very nice boat. He had sonar, uh, radars. Uh, he had entered into tournaments and won. So I said in my heart, 
that if I am going to win this man for Christ, I have to learn about fishing. I don't know anything about fishing. I never have done any fishing in my life. So I went to my most trusted source in the world, Google, and I downloaded articles on fishing, and I started reading them. It's kind of like learning how to swim without being in the water. So the following week, I went and visited with this family, and I shared with this guy my vast knowledge about fishing. He was very impressed. So week after week, I am praying for him, and I am building the relationship. I, I really started to love him, and that's what we need to do. We need to love people. Even if they don't accept Christ, we still love them. And one day, I said to him, can I go fishing with you? Oh, he said, yes, absolutely. He said, just come next Sunday. We will go to uh, a lake in Indiana. And I said, can I bring my my son, he said, oh, yes, bring him in. And he said, lunch on me. The whole week, I prayed for an opportunity to share Christ with this guy. On Wednesday, I fasted on his behalf. And then on Sunday afternoon, we went out on the lake in Indiana. It was a wonderful time, wonderful fellowship. And at the end of five hours, we came back. My son caught two big ones. I caught seven big ones. Seven. He didn't get any. <laughs> Nothing. He got exasperated. He got upset. He looked at me and he said, you told me you never have fished. How did you do this? I said, I prayed about it. He said, teach me about prayer. <laughs> so I started to teach him about prayer, and that was the opening wedge to share with him with Christ. And eventually he got baptized. My wife and I stayed with this family, and uh, he was a big contractor. And one day he read in our bulletin about a need to build wells in Belize. And he and his wife donated a whole year and went to that. So, so God works in wonderful ways. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so turn to maybe three or four people next to you and share two things. What you learned today. And second, what are you going to do with it? So two things. What you learned and what you are going to do with it. Can we have a microphone we could use? Are these? Yeah. Maybe you could have. Uh, here, I will go get it for you. Give them a couple more minutes.
we are 45 now, so we experience 50% church growth in, in less than one hour. I mean, that was really amazing growth. <laughs> <laughs> Did they order these short because they don't go all the way to the end? No, they, they were just to see what would be the best options. Okay. Okay, maybe you could share with us now what you learned. You want to help us? Oh, well, one thing I learned this morning, we're just now starting where, the, oh, I'm loud enough, really. <laughs> um, we're learning, <laughs> uh, we're learning, well, the kids are learning how to be You are one of the teachers or one of the Sabbath school teachers. No, teacher. I'm, I'm just parent. <laughs> yeah, you are parent. Um, but... The elders in the church are taking children that want to serve in the church, and they're mentoring them how to help with the church service. Praise the so Lord. So that goes right into your mentoring, and it's made yeah. a big difference. It, yeah. it makes them not just bench warmers, but a fabric of the church, and it gives them a responsibility within their own church so they feel an ownership of it. Amen. Wonderful. Awesome. And even incorporate them into leadership in, in the board and other activities. Yes. In Sabbath school. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? We talked about we don't, we as a church, we as an individual don't pray enough. You got to take the mic. Take the mic. I have to. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so they can hear you in the back. We, I'll just say me. And these ladies agreed. Them too. We don't pray enough for people. The most important thing you could ever do for your church, for yourself, for your family, is to pray like crazy. To pray like your life depends on it. Yes. Yes. And it does, exactly. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, one of the churches I pastored um, had 40 people. And it was extremely dysfunctional, falling apart. And I tried a lot of techniques, and it went from 40 to 30. But when we started to pray, it went to 800 in attendance. Wow. That, not only that, but the atmosphere become, became healthy and grace-filled and loving. Uh, it, prayer makes all the difference in the world. Yes, she said that, yeah. What do you teach? Here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, Ashley. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know. He told me I was supposed to come and find you and talk to you, and then I got distracted. Oh, so no at problem. some point in yeah. time. Um, one of the things that I thought about um, when you were talking about why people come to Christ, why I came to Christ was my family because my family was like third generation Adventist, but it was not the best practicing atmosphere. Why I remain an Adventist is because of a pastor. Oh. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there, but I feel like they're two different things because sometimes we can be aware of the truths, um, but until we have that relationship with someone who is actively um, in a relationship with God, we don't really you know, stay. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And by the way, if you notice, the pastor in the Adventist church got 20%, while the pastor in the evangelical church got 5%. Uh, apparently, Adventist pastors tend to be more effective. Uh, we'll take one more. I was just telling Luke, um, in this church alone, there are three or four families that we're connected to from the past, either through a relative or through a friend. 
and our friends from Florida here today. Uh, Jeff was a roommate with his uncle at the academy, so we, I didn't know that until his uncle passed away a couple months ago, but we are all connected in the family of God, and they've all uh, influenced us in one way or another. And I myself was brought in through my parents, and we were, we are seven generation Adventists. But I'm in the church because of a lot of different mentors, but like yourself, uh, you shared that um, most people were in the church because of their spouse or their teacher or someone like that. Growing up, I had two women in my uh, mental life that would tap me on the shoulder when I was gonna make a bad decision. My Sabbath school teacher, Mrs. Emmerich, would say, you know God wouldn't be pleased with you. And my mother would be tapping me on the other shoulder in my mind, you know that Jesus wouldn't be happy with you and I taught you better. So the mentors are very important uh, in the church and out of the church. Absolutely. And as a child, the influences that you receive are very, very important. So it is very important to choose our friends. And our pastors are big influence and they've taught us a lot of things, not only how to mentor people, but uh, to visit and different things. My husband and I both are retired pastors and we know what it's like to feed the people, but not all of them come to Christ even after a full-fledged Bible study. So it depends on the Holy Spirit and how we individually allow the Lord to lead. Amen. So we're mentored by many people. So true, so true. Uh, just four F's of why some people stay in the church. Four F's. F number one is faith. And we have to be instrumental in helping other people to grow in their faith. We have to provide the opportunity, the environment for people to grow in their faith. Number two is function, which is ministry. Every study that have been done among young people, the young people who stay in the church are the people who are involved in some kind of meaningful ministry. Number three is at least you have to have seven friends. And we need to be friends to everyone, but especially get into the life of somebody in a deeper way. And the last one is what we call fellowship, but the atmosphere of the church. The more loving the atmosphere, the better off the church is. Any question before I move into my last story? Okay. So um, I graduated from Walla Walla College, and I went to my first church, and it was in Spokane, Washington, Spokane Valley. Big church was at that time, and it still is. I was an associate pastor. I arrived at the church, and they introduced me that Sabbath. And at the end of the second service, they run two services, a woman came to me, and she said, my name is Sally. I am the vacation Bible school leader here at this church. And tomorrow, we are starting vacation Bible school. And because we have a lot of kids, we are running two shifts, one in the morning and one in the evening. And you, Pastor Joe, are going to be the devotional speaker in the morning and in the evening. And next Sabbath, you will be preaching three times with the kids helping you out. And she said, thank you so much for accepting my invitation. <laughs> That's it. And she left me. Well, I didn't even know the theme of the Vacation Bible School. I didn't have any of my books yet. I, I, I just arrived. Well, I did the best I could. The following Sabbath, at the end of the second service, a woman came to me and she said, I live in Redding, California. My sister lives here. I came to visit with my sister. I invited her kids to come to vacation Bible school, but uh, they had soccer practices. 
but I know my sister is interested. Could you please go and visit with her? So here's what happened. Um, Sally was vacation Bible school leader. I took her to Laura. Laura was the one who was really interested, and she was. She was very interested in knowing more and more about Jesus. Now, Laura had two kids, Charles and Kim. Those are the kids who were going to come to vacation Bible school, but had soccer practices, so she couldn't come. She brought them into the Bible study. And Laura had a daughter by the name of Sue who lived in the basement with a boyfriend by the name of Ty. So Laura took me downstairs and she said to Ty and Sue to study the Bible with me. They said, we are not interested at all. She said, you either study the Bible with Pastor Joe or I'm kicking you out on the street. So I got a Bible study with two people who didn't want to be homeless. That's the only reason why. It was a terrible Bible study. Zero interest. Every time I went there, the television would be on. They would be drinking, smoking. But God was doing something amazing upstairs. Laura, Charles, and Kim, a few months later, got baptized. Laura was so much on fire for God. She started a small group in her house, and she invited her, name, her neighbor, Dee, who invited her husband, Ken, and Dee also invited a neighbor by the name of Terry, a few months later, all three of them were baptized. 21 people got baptized from this. This took place over two years. And I was still was going to study with Ty and Sue. One day, I got upset with them. And I said, look at you. You are wasting your lives. You don't do anything. You don't even contribute to society. You're just sitting here in the basement, drinking and smoking. But God has a wonderful plan for your lives. And I cited Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you hope and a better future. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And I left. And I spent the whole week praying and fasting on behalf of this couple. The following week I went back, there were four of them. Ty and Sue invited their friends, Edgar and Terry. And a few months later, all four of them got baptized. This Ty, it's Ty Gibson. Uh, some of you know him. He's a very well-known evangelist, especially appealing to younger crowd. Actually, he came just before the pandemic to Andrews University and had a week of prayer. And that was his first sermon. And he made me famous all over campus. Everywhere I went, people came and talked to me. And, of course, that faded away over time. And, and uh, uh, we discover one thing important, and that is the verse in Jeremiah 29 is so true. And God has a wonderful plan for you. The Bible has a very, very significant word. It's oikos. That's a Greek word. It's not the yogurt. Oikos means household. That's the way the King James and the New King James translates it. If we translate that in our time, we'll be networking. And that's what it is. You see, it's kind of like a web evangelist. That's how the gospel is spread. That's how the gospel goes all over the world. Uh, 
you know, people connect with each other and bring them to Christ. Is there room for all of these methods, the literature, the public evangel? Of course, because God reaches different people in different ways. But it's still the most effective person in reaching people for Christ is you. Father in heaven, thank you that you have just entrusted to us this ministry of reconciliation. That's what you called us, to go into all of the world and tell them that God has reconciled them through Jesus and made them his children. Lord, help us to have healthy churches filled with grace and love so people could thrive and could grow. In Jesus' name, amen. William was in love with Jesus and set out to read his Bible again. Sitting here in this room and starting in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, he made his way methodically through the Bible using his Cruden's Concordance. When he came across a word or a verse that he did not understand, he would cross-reference it until he came to a full understanding. He came to Daniel 8.14, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed, and did not understand it. Rather than reading on, he stopped there, stayed there, studied it out, and his conclusions would have a far-reaching impact. The motivating factor in William's life was not a pursuit of head knowledge, but it was his love of Jesus. It was a deep love and a force that kept him going. As he continued his study of Daniel 8, he came to the conclusion that Jesus would come in about 25 years. As he studied and re-studied, he concluded in 1818 that Jesus would come around the year 1843. Yet despite having this great news, he did nothing about it, keeping it mainly to himself. He did tell a few friends, but did nothing publicly. He was worried that he would be made fun of and did not want to leave his hometown to speak. He did write some articles that were published, but as yet he had done no preaching. William struggled with the call to preach for 13 years. He heard in his mind over and over the words, go and tell the world. Finally, one day, he made a prayer of commitment that if he was asked to preach, then he would go. He felt this was a pretty safe fleece, for no one was going to ask a 50-year-old farmer to preach about the second coming. Not long after, his doorbell rang and his nephew Irvin Guilford was there and he asked him if he would come to Dresden to share the things that he had been studying. Rather than there being thankful his prayer had been answered, he stormed out the door angrily. He walked out of his house and came to this maple grove here and paced up and down. His daughter Lucy followed him and after watching a while, she went back inside 
and said, Mommy, something's wrong with Daddy. You see, something was wrong. He was under conviction and could not reason his way out of it. His nephew lived over half an hour away, which meant he left his house before Miller prayed the prayer of commitment and he could thus see the moving of God in this situation. As the sign says, he went in a farmer and came out a preacher. After accepting the call to preach, Miller traveled extensively over the next 10 years across the northeastern parts of the United States with his prophecy charts and Bible with him. Many were converted and the revival wasn't linked to a particular denomination. Although Miller was a Baptist, one estimate has him winning over 40,000 to the Baptist church and over 40,000 to the Methodist church. It was not long before he would meet up with Joshua V. Hines thus extending his influence from the spoken word to the written word. Maybe God is calling you to the ministry to preach. Maybe you have been resisting his call like William did for 13 years. I want to assure you that the best place to be is safe in the peace that you are not resisting the Holy Spirit and that you're following God's will for your life. If God is calling you, then step out in faith and let him lead. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Uh, glad that you all are here today. Uh, it's going to be a very, very special day. Remember, just to, we have just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, Vespers tonight is at 5.55 p.m. Remember that time, 5.55. And then next, we have a special guest with us. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Wanted to say hi to my church there in Taylor Mill. Another one of our pastors here. Hi. Yeah. Just wanted to tell you, I'm here at the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Right here behind me is the traditional burial place of Jesus. Now, this church is um, is separated into different groups, religious groups. You have Coptic, you have Roman Catholic, you have Greek Orthodox, and um, Boy, just a number of different religious groups that use this church. It's, uh, though, is certainly a lot more than we have, dirt, most certainly. It is uh, pretty cool. I'm going to kind of tilt the camera up. You can see this dome. Apparently, it was refinished in the year, right before the year 2000 for the visit of the Pope. Uh, for the Millennium Celebration. But either way, wanted to see uh, if I could just say hi to everyone, miss you, and uh, you have a wonderful Sabbath. If you don't remember, Pastor Jared is over in the Holy Land with uh, a group of pastors from the Kentucky Tennessee Conference. You want to remember the daylight savings time this weekend? So tonight, before you go to bed, move your clocks and watches forward by an hour. We have with us special today, Doctor, uh, excuse me, Pastor Joe Kidder. Um, he's a professor at Andrews University. <clears throat> and he's going to be here with us for the worship service, and then we're having a uh, uh, fellowship meal afterwards. So you all are invited to the, to the meal. Uh, after the meal, he, he's going to do another presentation. And then after that presentation, he's going to have a training session for all the uh, church leaders. So please stand by for the, uh, for the uh, uh, full day of activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. At this time, if the praise team will come and lead us in our songs. All right. Oh, you got to back up. 
That's great. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Glad to see all of you here and we're glad for some sunshine since we've had a lot of dreary weather last few days. So we're glad you're here on this beautiful Sabbath day. So we'll start. I'm going to let you sit down for this first one. We're going to start our song service with Trust and Obey. <clears throat> because we're singing stand up stand up for Jesus <clears throat> can't sing that sitting down Shall reign 
decide to enter into our worship service, let's sing I Love You, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King. It's time for us to communicate with our Heavenly Father. We have those who are ill in our congregation, and if, if at all possible, would you kneel and as we pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you are the great physician. You, you know those that are in our midst that need, that need prayer, that need healing. We pray, Father, that you will be with them and comfort them. Comfort their families also, Father. Give them peace. We pray, Father, that as we go through the rest of this service, that your Holy Spirit will be here amongst us. And may the angels wrap their wings around so that Satan and his, and his evil ones cannot yes. enter into our midst. We pray, Father, now that you will forgive us where we have failed you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God cares so much about us that he constantly provides for our needs even before they arise. Before the beginning of the crisis in Egypt, God not only provided seven years of abundance, he also informed Pharaoh about the severe famine that would follow and inspired Joseph to save the surplus, adequately preparing for the crisis. Joseph recognized God before his brothers as someone who works in anticipation of our needs. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Our needs and emergencies of today never take God by surprise or put him off balance. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the wife of a family living in a foreign country had to renew her employment authorization. This authorization was issued by the government and would allow foreigners to work. But the renovation process took much longer than expected, and her current work authorization expired after a few months of waiting. Consequently, she was terminated from her job and the family's budget did not balance anymore. They constantly checked the status of her application, thinking that the work authorization would come in a few days but the waiting period increased from three to four to five months and finally up to nine months. 
Interestingly, exactly seven months before she lost her job, many companies closed down due to COVID and dismissed employees, causing a record high unemployment rate. But she miraculously held on to her job, allowing the family to consolidate their emergency fund, even ignoring the challenge they would soon face. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. If you are experiencing a prosperous time now, take advantage of this opportunity. It may be that God is working in anticipation of something ahead. It was the work of God that made provision for this family even before their need arose, and they built up their emergency fund instead of spending carelessly. And it was that action that kept them afloat during the crisis that followed the time of abundance. This week, as we worship with our tithe and promise, regular and systematic offerings, let us show gratitude to the only one who has solutions for our unforeseen crisis. May we put our desires last and God first. May the deacons come forward. Dear God, please help us to have a good day and and let this money be used correctly. Amen. It's time for our children's story. So if the children would go back to the back of the church and uh, pick up your buckets and collect your offerings. There's someone back there ready to give them to you.
Good morning. Look how many you are. Oh my goodness. Oh, I brought something with me that I want to show you. I brought this. Does anybody know what this is? It's a little something. It is. It's a little digital camera. Now we you don't see a lot of people using cameras much. What do we usually take pictures with now? People's phones, right? Yeah, but this, so I've had this for a, quite a while, many years, and I've got a lot of pictures saved on it. Let me see if I can cut it off. Ooh, did you see that? And then this is the little screen where you look and you can see your pictures. Now I've got a lot of pictures saved on here of my boys when they were super small. So if I saw them doing something really cute, I'll get them to stop so I could take a picture. Does your mom ever do that? Stop, let me get a picture. And you're like, oh, mom, you've taken a million pictures. Yes, we love to take pictures. So a long time ago when my boys were super little, one Sunday morning we went with some people from our church to go ride bikes at a park. So we, we loaded up our bikes and we went to ride bikes. And I was taking a lot of pictures with this little camera. And so when we got home, I unpacked our stuff, and I put the bag that I usually took to the park, I put it in the back of my closet for the next time we went to the park, and I forgot all about it. Well, a couple of weeks later, I wanted to take a picture with my camera, and I couldn't find it. I looked everywhere. I thought I looked everywhere. I looked in my room. I looked in the kitchen. I looked in the bathroom. I looked everywhere for this little camera, and I couldn't find it. Now, do you think I was happy or sad about that? Sad. Super sad. I have so many pictures on here. I didn't want to lose my camera. And so in Sabbath school, if you come to primary Sabbath school, sometimes we say, if you don't know what to do, you should pray. That's right. I was so upset. I couldn't find my camera. So this is what I did. I said, I don't know where my camera is, but God knows where my camera is. So I sat on the edge of my bed. And I had tears in my eyes, and I was so sad. And this is what I prayed. I said, God, I can't find my camera. I want that little camera. It's so special to me. You know where that camera is. Will you please show me? And before I opened my eyes, a little thought popped in my head, and guess what it was? It was little Joseph, and he was on his bicycle at the park. And I opened my eyes and I said, oh, I know where the camera is. It's in my bag I take to the park. And I ran to the closet and I pulled the bag out and I opened it up. And what do you think I found? My little camera. God answered my prayer immediately. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes we have to wait a little bit for an answer. But that particular day showed me just like that. Now, when something amazing like that happens in our life, do you think we should share that with other people? Share that story? Yeah. Why? Because what happens when you share it? Then other people know what God can do. That's right, Abby. Other people smile and they see how amazing God is. And it makes your, it makes your faith stronger. It makes your love for God stronger. And then you can tell somebody else that story and it'll help them. And it just goes and goes and goes. So when God does something amazing in your life, Tell somebody. Tell me. I'll use it for children's story. But tell somebody. Okay? Then we can all just have more love for God than we had a few minutes ago. Okay? So close your eyes and let's have a short prayer and we'll go back to our seats. Dear Father, we are so thankful that you care for us. And we're so thankful that when we pray, you hear us. Thank you for loving us. Help us to have a wonderful Sabbath day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peter answered and said to him, 
See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. That was Arthur Bear that uh, did our scripture reading and called for the uh, offering. And now his sister, Devana, is going to do our special music. We are honored today to have Pastor Joe Kidder with us. And if he'll come at this time and uh, share with what the Lord has for us. Thank you very much. Every time I accept an invitation to go anywhere, I start praying for the people. So for the last several weeks, I have a habit of going around Anders University and for the last few weeks, I have been praying for you. I actually only one person here, and he is not even here. <laughs> but God knows all of you, and that's what's important. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, wonderful uh, special music and uh, for the children's story of God really does answer our prayers. And I do like very much the fact that uh, 
the children, the young people are involved in the life of the church. That's wonderful. Uh, my <clears throat> assignment for this morning was already given to me. Pastor Jared asked me to tell you how I became a Christian. I was born in the city of Nineveh. I am the product of Jonah. <laughs> so if you have any doubt about Jonah, just look at me, and all doubts will be removed. Does anybody know where Nineveh is? You are close, but not Turkey. It's in Iraq. So I'm going to show you some pictures. Uh, do you see Mosul in the north? Mosul is the modern city where Nineveh is. However, the modern city and the old city are called the district of Nineveh. And the state is called the state of Nineveh. Here, you could see that. Nineveh. Nineveh is the Arabic way of saying Nineveh. Well, Iraq is uh, very rich in Bible references. Abraham and Sarah came from the southern part of Iraq, Nasiriya. That's all of the Chaldean in the south. Let me see if, if this will work. Yeah, here it is. That's where Abraham came from. Babylon is right here, about 65 miles to the west of Baghdad. Baghdad is the capital. Baghdad is not a very old city. It was uh, built in the 1100. Damascus uh, goes all the way back to the Old Testament. In the north are the Assyrian, the Babylonian here, and Hammurabi, who was the first king that invented uh, the writing uh, and laws, came from that part of the world. Uh, here you could see this is the state of Nineveh. Unfortunately, in history, this is uh, where ISIS occupied that part of the world and did a lot of damage. Well, thank you very much. This is one of the first recorded writing in history. Uh, this is the entrance to the uh, city of Babylon. And this is the gate of Ashtar. This is actually a fake one. The original one is in the museum in Berlin. Uh, Ashtar was a Babylonian goddess. Uh, here is a closer image of uh, the, uh, uh, the image. These are the walls of the city of, uh, of, ba of Nineveh, actually, these. these Walls are 2,700 years old. And they are still standing up to now. Um, more pictures of the walls. Uh, several um, uh, gates that lead into the city. This is the one from the south side. This is Nineveh at the time of Jonah. This is Ashur Panipal. Several Assyrian kings are mentioned in the Bible, but this one is not. The, the contribution of this one is the canal system and the library system. He was a lover of poetry, so he collected 20,000 tablets, and that became the first library in the world. All of this was destroyed by ISIS. They, they did not leave anything. The city, the walls, the churches, the museum were all destroyed by ISIS. Uh, Jonah came from Joppa. He was supposed to go to Nineveh because God really loves the city, and God today loves the city, and he wants to send us to the city to evangelize it. But Jonah went into the opposite direction. But God found him and sent him back again to Nineveh. 
This is the grave of Jonah. My house was 10 kilometers, that's six miles from the grave of Jonah. Used to be originally an Orthodox church. And then it became a mosque and they built this minaret on top of it. No more. ISIS destroyed it. Every year, for thousands of years, the people of Nineveh, during this week, fasted and prayed in honor of Jonah. They don't do that anymore because of what happened, of ISIS occupying the place. They put the letter N on all of the homes of the Christians. When ISIS got into the city of uh, Mosul, they were... 35,000 Christians, N stand for Nazarene, and that's what they refer to the Christians. Uh, half Orthodox, half Catholic, they asked them to either convert to Islam or leave the city. All of them left the city, leaving their belonging, their homes, their businesses. Only nine of them converted to the Muslim faith, which really should give us an inspiration to always stand faithful to God. The Christian community in Iraq today is 400,000 people out of a population of 40 million. That's just 1%. About uh, half and half Orthodox Catholic, and this is an uh, Orthodox church. Do you know how it is an Orthodox church? The shape of the cross is slightly different. And this is the Seventh-day Adventist church in Iraq. There's only one church in a country of 40 million people. Uh, the church was bombed eight times. So now they have the deacons protecting it. And you thought being a deacon was a hard job. <laughs> so imagine being a deacon in Iraq. I am really not kidding you. The people from the outside are soldiers from the government assigned to uh, protect the church. But the people from the inside are the deacons who patrol the church and report to the authority. The story I'm about to share with you started to unfold approximately 40 years ago. It didn't happen in Nineveh. It happened in Baghdad. My father was a businessman into grocery business and he wanted to expand his business, so he moved the family to Baghdad. And many of my uh, uncles and cousins who worked with him moved with us. And one day, by divine providence, my cousin and I decided to take a walk. And we ended up being in front of this church. And we went in, and the result, I was beaten almost to death by my family. I was abandoned by them. I lost two years of schooling because of the Sabbath and a scholarship that covered four years. That was 40 years ago. But about 13 years ago, I discovered I am alive today because of that experience. And I started to see Wonderful blessings I never expected. One of them just happened last year. The theme of what I'm going to share with you is that when we are faithful to Jesus, he will make all things to work for good for us. All things. Before I start, I counted 15 young people here in the front. Wonderful. Uh, so... I am going to ask you two questions. And if you get the right answers only today and only upon the approval of your mom and dad, you could eat two pieces of dessert. <laughs> I don't know if we have enough, but uh, we will go for that. But it has to be somebody who is 15 years or younger. The first question why it is so difficult to be a Christian in the Middle East, and specifically, even more so, 
an Adventist, but why it is so difficult to be a Christian in the Middle East. And the second one is, what happened to my mother? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I just ask you that you'll speak through me. Lord, I prayed about it. I ask you to speak through me, but the power only comes from you. So I'm just asking that the conviction of hearts, the work of the Spirit, will be just extremely powerful in this place and that people will be drawn closer to you. Lord, as we see how you work in the life of one individual, that's the way you work in all of our lives. And at the end of the sermon, Lord, I pray that all of us will stand in awe and amazement of the kind of God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a young man going to high school, I wanted to be a professional soccer player. And my idol in life was Pelé. I don't know if you know that name. It shows how old you are if you remember that name. Well, I didn't make it. But on a Friday afternoon, I called my cousin and I invited him over to come to my house so we could practice soccer. My cousin was a weird individual. He was the only person in the whole country who did not appreciate soccer. Something horribly wrong with him. So we played for 15 or 20 minutes, and he said, I don't like this. I'm done. I felt an obligation toward him. I said, what do you want to do? He said, well, we are new to the city of Baghdad. Let's go for a walk. So we start walking five miles. And we eventually came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It was right in front of us. In Iraq, you cannot do any form of evangelism. No public evangelism, no personal evangelism. But the pastor of this church was creative. So he decided to show a movie about the life of Christ. And he had an advertisement this big posted to the gate of the church, inviting people to go in and watch the movie. If it was any bigger than this, he would have been arrested and put in jail. But he was praying that somebody will see this ad and will go in and watch the movie. When my cousin saw the ad, and he looked at me and he said, we don't have anything to do. Let's go in and watch the movie. Maybe we will learn something in you. And we went in, and we sat on this side of the church. And for the first time in my life, I saw Jesus on the screen. I saw his miracles. I heard his teaching. And I fell in love with him. I was really amazed. That's exactly what the Bible talks about. When people heard Jesus, they were amazed. And then I saw his death and his resurrection, his love, that it drove him to die for me. I was so moved. I felt that love coming from the screen straight to my heart, and I started to cry. And... I was so moved. At the end of the movie, I went to the pastor and I asked him if I could learn more about Jesus. Later on, I learned that this pastor was at this church for 20 plus years. But I was the first Bible study he ever have had from outside of the church. 
Imagine 20 years of discouragement. I made his career for him. He would never forget me. Well, we studied the Bible for a few months. I didn't know anything. So he introduced me to the Old Testament and the New Testament, to the major characters of the Bible. And one day, I went to the church to have another Bible study, but we didn't. That's the answer to the first question. He said to me, you have been coming here for several months. It's time for you to accept Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. That was hard for me because I grew up in a culture where if you change your faith, They persecute you, they ostracize you, they shun you, they might even kill you. And I didn't want any of that stuff to happen to me. So I gave up the Bible study. But praise the Lord, he never gave up on me. Every day I felt the nudging of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I got to the point I couldn't handle it. So I went back again for another Bible study. And this time, we had a Bible study on the Ten Commandments. I didn't have any problem with the Ten Commandments except for one of them. The Sabbath one, you are right, the fourth one. Ironically, in Arabic, the language I grew up speaking, we don't have names for the days of the week. So Sunday is called the first day. Monday is called the second day. The only one that has a name is the seventh one. We call it Sabbath. Sabbath. And everybody knew it's a day of of rest and worship. The problem was that the day off in Iraq is Friday. And everybody is forced to work on the Sabbath go to school on the Sabbath. So I I said, I would never have uh, any future. I would never be able to go to school and graduate, find a job. So I said to myself, I need a second opinion. So I decided to go and visit with a Greek Orthodox pastor. After I explained to him my dilemma, he lifted up the Bible like this. And he said, if you go by the Bible, you need to keep the seven-day Sabbath holy. I wanted to strangle this man. I said, this is not what I wanted to hear from you. Incidentally, some pockets of the Orthodox Church Even up to today, they might still believe in keeping the Sabbath. Some even might keep it. The Ethiopic Orthodox Church changed the day of worship from uh, from Sabbath to Sunday only 160 years ago. Well, a couple weeks later, I went and visited with uh, a Catholic priest. He said, we changed the day. I wanted a biblical answer. So a couple weeks later, I went and visited with a Presbyterian pastor. Their church was behind this building over here. Unbeknown to me, the Adventist pastor befriended the Presbyterian pastor. And for Christmas... He gave him a gift. It was a book. It was called The Great Controversy. He read the book. When I met with him, he said, I have been struggling with this issue myself. And I have come to the conclusion that we really need to keep the seven-day Sabbath holy. Uh, I witnessed the baptism of this pastor. 
He was kicked out of his church, received some persecution, and ended up going to Sweden. In the time when I was attending the church in Baghdad, I witnessed the, also the baptism of uh, an Orthodox bishop. A bishop is like the equivalent of our conference president. He is in charge of a bunch of churches in a city. But in my case, I said, what difference does it make? Just pick a day and worship God on it. But the Holy Spirit reminded me that we are in the mess we are in because two people said, what difference does it make to eat out of this tree or that tree? They all are trees. It's not about the tree. It's not even about the day. It's about our love and allegiance and loyalty to Jesus. Well, I graduated from high school at that time. And in Iraq, they had a system. You graduate from high school, and if your grades are high enough, you could go and take another test. And if you do very well in that test, if you score 90 and above, you could go to any college of your choice for free. But there was a catch. If you score 70 or below, you go to the army immediately. Well, nobody wants to go to the army immediately. Uh, but I decided to take my chances. I went and took the exam. And I scored high enough to go to the School of Engineering for free for four years. I wanted to be an engineer from the day I was born. Not because I have any passion for engineering. They just make more money than anybody else in that country. <laughs> but it was not a good thing for me. Because for a whole year, I didn't feel a need for God. I didn't go to church. I didn't read the Bible. The only thing spiritually I did was I prayed before taking my exams. And, and that was for God to help me to do well in these exams. Well, fast forward with me to the end of the school year at the university in Baghdad. At that university, there was a tradition all of the exams come on one day. Guess which day? The Sabbath day. You start 9 o'clock in the morning, and you go to 6 in the evening, and you are done in one day. Well, something very unusual happened the Sunday before that. My mother was a casual Christian. But my mother was very consistent about her church attendance. She went to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. But that Sunday, before my final exams, there was some kind of a celebration at her Orthodox church. And she wanted to know, uh, to, to go, mainly to get more, you know, um, time with her friends, her family. But as you know, it's really hard to go when you are not in the habit of going every week. So she came to me and begged me to go to church with her. And I came up with every excuse I could come up with. But I failed. And I don't know whether it was to get her off my back or to please her. I said, fine. So we went to church. The place was jam-packed because of the celebration. We sat in the back. And they went through one hour of ritual. That's very similar to what Catholics do. And then the pastor came to preach. And he looked at the congregation. And he said, my heart is troubled. He said, something happened to me last night that never have happened to me before. He said, the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and gave me a new message to give to you. 
And the new message is on martyrdom, which means dying for Jesus. He said, I don't know why God is putting this on my heart, but I have to do what God asked me to do. Now, for someone like me, who haven't been to church for a whole year, this is the last topic I wanted to hear anything about. I mean, you go to church to feel good, to hear about hope or faith, not about that. But that sermon that day changed my life forever. I'd like you to open your scripture with me one more time to Matthew chapter 19. This is a question that Peter asked. It's a question actually all of you have asked in one way or another. And that is, what is the cost of following Jesus? What would happen to me if I follow Jesus? Matthew 19, 27 to 29. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? He said, well, what would be the reward for following you? What will happen to us? So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's really saying, ultimately, the greatest reward is eternity. But notice the next verse, and this is the one that changed my life. And everyone who has left houses. Friends, I want to tell you, sometimes when you follow Jesus, you have to leave your house behind you. Sometimes you have to leave your brothers and sisters or your father or mother. And you have to understand this is written in the context of Middle Eastern culture where your identity is bound with your family. And Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you have to leave everything behind you, including your mom and dad, your identity. Wife, you have to leave your wife, your husband, your children, or land for my name's sake. And then you shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And this is how the sermon went. He said, out of love for us, Jesus left heaven, became one of us, went all the way to the cross and died for us. Shouldn't we, out of love for him, do the same? He said, the disciples, according to this verse, left their boats, their moms, their dads, their businesses to follow Jesus. They are our example. We need to do the same. And somehow the Holy Spirit got hold of me. And I felt God's presence in such a way I have never felt it before. I felt that he was inside of me, all around me. I, I saw heaven opened up and saw Jesus sitting on the throne loving me. And I started to cry. And every time I remember that incident, I, I just feel the love of God inside of me. To borrow the words of John Wesley, my heart was strangely warmed with the grace of God. That's when the Holy Spirit gets hold of you. And at that moment, I decided I would follow Jesus no matter what. When the worship service was over, I said to my mom, you just stay and visit with your friends and I will see you at home. And I left the Orthodox Church and I started roaming on the streets of Baghdad filled with fear of what will happen to me if I follow Jesus. Five hours later, I ended up being at the home of the Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And I told him what happened in the Orthodox Church. I told him about 
my decision to follow Jesus, but I told him about my fears. I, I said, I might die. I will lose my schooling. I will lose my future. He said, let me tell you a story. And then he told me the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you know that story? That story actually happened 65 miles from my home in Baghdad. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the most powerful monarch at that time, built a statue. And he said to his subject, when you hear the music, you bow down and worship me. Everybody did, except for three people. They stood out. So the king said, bring them to me. And he said to them, look, I am a nice guy. I am a magnanimous king. I'm going to give you a second chance. When you hear the music, you bow down and worship me. And if you don't, I'm going to throw you into the furnace of fire. And no one, no one can save you from my hands. They said, oh, king, we know our God can't save us. But even if he doesn't, we will still worship him. And you know the rest of the story. They threw them into the furnace of fire. They made the fire seven times more hot because he was so angry. Here is the insight the pastor shared with me. Insights I will never forget. He said, those three friends prayed that God will deliver them from the fire. But God in his infinite wisdom decided to deliver them in the fire. Sometimes God delivers you from the fire, but sometimes God delivers you in the fire. He said, think about it. Because God delivered them in the fire, they had the greatest worship experience of their lives. Right there in the fire, Jesus showed up. And they walked with him, and they worshipped him. He said, because God decided to deliver them in the fire, they experienced the power of God. Did you know that the Bible tells us the people who threw them into the fire got evaporated from the intensity of the heat? Nothing happened to them. Not even the smell of smoke was on them. And because God delivered them in the fire, they became an inspiration to all of us. Only God knows how many times this story has been told to encourage the faith of the faithful. And then the pastor said to me, God spoke to you today. You need to respond. And rather than focusing on your problems, you need to focus on the greatness of our God. Friends, that's a problem we all fall into. We have a tendency to focus on our problems rather than on the greatness of our God. And then uh, I said to him, I really want to follow Jesus. Well, he said, pray after me and give your heart to Jesus. And I did. And I, I mean, I felt peace when I said that. I felt like, the peace that surpasses all understanding came to me. And then he said, you need to be baptized. I said, I want to. Well, he said, let's do it next Sabbath. Next Sabbath came. The exams, 9 o'clock, baptism, 1130. I woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I heard the voice saying, look, you have broken thousands of Sabbaths before. One more is not going to make much difference. Then I heard the voice of God say, it's not about the Sabbath, it's about me, how much you love me. And then I heard the other voice saying, you don't want to lose a whole year just because of a few hours. And then I heard the voice of God say, it's not about a year, it's about eternity. And then I heard the other voice saying, just go do it. God will understand. And then I heard the voice of God saying, just 
trust in me. I struggled all the way from 5 to 11. Finally, at 11, God gave me the victory, and I decided to follow him no matter what. I ran to the church. By the time I got to the church, the worship service was over. But most of the people were still out in the foyer, so they brought them back in, and we had the baptism. I lost the year, but I gained Jesus. And that's what's important in life. I lost the second year for the same reason, and the government felt like I was too dumb to spend any more money on, so they kicked me out of the university. When my dad saw all of this happening to me, he was angry. So he brought a hundred people from my family into our living room in Baghdad. It was a large living room, probably from the first pew here all the way to here. I was right here in the middle, surrounded by all of those people who would never have come if I was on drugs or a criminal, but they came to talk me out of being faithful to God. They talked and talked, and finally when my dad saw that I was not going to change my mind, he took off his shoes and threw them on me, which in the Middle East represent an afflicting shame on that individual. Um, You know, some of you might be too young to remember this, but when President Bush went to Iraq, They threw the shoe on him. Yeah, probably some of you do remember that. That gave permission to one of my brothers and one of my cousins to came, who lifted me up by my shoulders and started beating on me. They kept doing this till I became unconscious. I was bleeding everywhere. And finally, they threw me out on the street. It was like I was a cancer, and this was a a cleansing ceremony, and they wanted to get rid of this cancer. But God spared my life. He had a purpose for me. A few hours later, I came back to consciousness. I looked up into the skies, and I said, Lord, since I decided to follow you, I lost everything, my school, my family, my future. He said, maybe, but now you got me. And if you have Jesus, that's all what you need. And then I said, Lord, I feel the whole world is against me. He said, maybe, but I am for you. Paul said, if Christ is for us, it doesn't matter who is against us. Well, in this church at that time, there were 180 people. But in that mix, there was a young couple newly wed, in their probably late 20s, who took an interest in me. Every time I went to church, they would come and talk to me, pray with me, take me over to their home. They were wonderful people. So I decided to go to their house, and they took me in. And I stayed with them for several months. Uh, They encouraged me, they ministered to me. And one of the things we did every night was we read promises from the Bible. But there was one promise we repeated every night, and that is Romans 8, 28. I'm sure you know this by heart. And we know that how many things? Can we say it with enthusiasm? How many things? All things work together for good to those who love God. All things, even bad things, God eventually will make it to work for good for you. This family said, you don't have any future in Iraq. Go to Middle East College in Beirut, Lebanon. That's a small Adventist college in Beirut. I applied to go. I couldn't go because it was not accredited. And that was another disappointment. And then uh, the war between the Arab countries and Israel started. And one day, I got a letter from the army saying I needed to report for a duty in six weeks. It was the most horrible day of my life. It was um, the death sentence, basically. 
My father at that time knew I was living with this family and knew about the letter. So he also wrote me a letter, said, he said, look, if you renounce your faith, I will accept you back home. I will find a way for you to leave the country and go to Europe to study and avoid the army. I was very tempted to take my dad up on his offer. But praise the Lord for the community of faith, for the church. They encouraged me to stay faithful to God. They prayed for me to stay faithful. Did you know in the New Testament, between Jesus and Paul, 65 times, 65 times, we are told to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to love one another, and to forgive one another. 65 times. I am here because a group of people in this church in Baghdad prayed for me to stay faithful. Well, my neighbor, who was my best friend, got a letter similar to the one I got. He was slightly older than me, so he went to the army right away. And in one week, the news came back he was killed. So they had a memorial service for him. My mom went to that service. She was emotionally moved. She came back home and she said to my dad, I don't care whatever my son is. I just want to see him. It took some convincing. Finally, my dad accepted me. I came home. I, my bedroom was upstairs. I went to bed, my bedroom about 10.30 to sleep. When my brother and my cousin who lifted me up came and said, we need to go for a walk. I was terrified. I said, I don't want to. They yanked me out of bed, took me to a park. When we got to the park, it was midnight. No light. No people. Pitch dark. We got to the park. We got to the middle, and they stopped. I said, this is the end. So I started to pray. Five minutes, nothing happened. Ten minutes, nothing. I was anticipating a, 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 a shot or a knife stab, nothing. Twelve, thirteen minutes went by. Finally, my cousin broke the silence. He said, look, you are either crazy to go through what you went through, or you have something we would like to have. That gave me the opportunity of sharing my faith with my brother and with my cousin. We were there till 6 in the morning. At 6 in the morning, my brother gave his heart to Jesus. My brother was the ultimate secular. But today he worshiped Jesus. My brother got so excited about finding Jesus. He went home and he led his family to Christ. And my cousin, the one who started the beating, became the pastor of this church. We do have a God who makes all things to work for good for those who love him. And because of the ministry of my cousin and my brother, several members of my family came to know Jesus. I have been praying for my two brothers to come here because circumstances are terrible over there. And four years ago, I met my brother after not seeing him for more than 30 years at the airport in Kalamazoo, Michigan. My cousin wanted to stay there and take care of the church, but there was a hit on all of the pastors. Last year, I prayed for him. 
and now he is in Canada, and he started um, an Arabic-speaking internet uh, church uh, that meets three, four times every week. They meet on Friday, they meet on Sabbath, and they meet on Sunday to accommodate for various groups of people. Um, if you see anything on the news, just pray for the few people who remain in this church in Baghdad and for God's work over there. I still have to tell you how I'm alive. But listen to the story of how church should be done. The family I was staying with, they said, look, you still have to go to study in order to avoid the army. If you study, you could avoid the army. But if you don't, you have to go right away. For 40 years, the church in Iraq have been trying to get Middle East College to be accredited, and they failed for 40 years. They tried bribery, connection, influence. Nothing worked. So somebody said, why don't we try prayer? So 50 people went into the basement of this church and uh, spent three days in a prayer and fasting and worship. I cannot explain this to you, but only God can. On a Tuesday of that same week, they got the letter from the government that Middle East College was accredited. 40 years of a human efforts failed. But when God's people prayed, God did it immediately. My advice to you is don't even wait for 40 seconds. Don't waste your time. Take whatever you got to the Lord immediately. So I went to Middle East College. But shortly after I arrived, the Civil War started. I had nothing to do with it. Believe me, it was just a coincidence that started when I arrived. And somebody came to me and said, you still want to be an engineer? I said, yes. He said, go to Walla Walla College. Uh, do we have anybody who ever have been there? We have a couple, three people. Well, my first reaction was, who in his right mind would go to Walla Walla? Because in Arabic, it sounded like the place of the double curse. Well, they assured me it has nothing to do with that. It took my church 13 months to pray for me. And finally, I made it to Walla Walla. 13 months of fasting and a prayer. By the way, the church over there fasts a lot more than the church here. I took engineering. And uh, I work as an engineer for three months. That was the dream of my life. Now, if we are an engineer, we need you. If you are a doctor or a, a nurse or a teacher, because that's the best way to reach people of, uh, who are doing the same thing. But for me, I felt a calling from God. So I went back again to Walla Walla, took theology, and I pastored for 20 years, and then I came to teach at the seminary. 13 years ago, I have a female cousin who came to this country to do advanced medical training. She never went back again to Iraq. But 13 years ago, she wanted to go to Iraq to see how our family are doing after the several wars that happened over there. When she came back, I went to her house. She said, sit down. You will never believe what I am going to tell you. She said, your mom is praising the Lord for your faithfulness every day. I said, my mom kicked me out of home. She said, your mom is praising the Lord for the Sabbath every day. I said, you're not making any sense. She said, your mom now goes to the Adventist church. She's studying with your cousin. She wants to be baptized in the Adventist church. I said, why? Well, she said, shortly after you left the country, the war between Iraq and Iran started. And one million people of your age group died. She said, your age group is completely wiped out. And then there was a war with Kuwait. That's the little country to the south. 
and then three wars with the United States, but you are alive. I didn't know that I am alive today because one day I decided to follow Jesus. My mom got baptized, and three months after her baptism, she died. She was diabetic, and there were no adequate medication. I wish I was there to witness her baptism, but it was not safe. But I'm looking forward to seeing her in heaven. Amen. We do have a God who makes all things to work for good for us. I'm just going to share with you a couple lessons. The first lesson, always determine in your heart to be faithful to God, no matter what. For me, the struggle was over the Sabbath, but all of us have some kind of a struggle. Just determine, decide that you will follow Jesus. You will be faithful to him, that you will honor him no matter what. And rather than focusing on your problems, focus on the greatness of his power. Did you know that in the Bible there are many stories of how God could do the impossible. The first one, one day, God came to a woman who was 91 years old, barren all her life. Her husband was 100 years old and said to her, I am going to give you a child. You're going to bear a child. You know what she did? Because she thought it was a joke. I mean, after all, she was a candidate for the nursing home, not the maternity ward. (laughs) But God gave her the child anyway. You have a little boy defeating a giant. And Jesus said to us, if you just trust in me, you could move mountains. Whatever mountain you have, God is bigger than that. And then pray like your life depends on it. I saw the power of prayer. The church for 40 years trying to get Middle East College to be accredited, and they failed. They prayed, and God did it. My church prayed for me for 13 months, fasted once a week. And then I got the visa to come here. In fact, when this was happening, I went to one of the professors at Middle East College. And I said, I really need to go to the United States. He said, don't even think about it. It will never happen. I said, why not? He said, well, you don't have money. You don't know the language. And these are the minor problems. I said, what is the major problem? He said, the United States is not giving any visa to anybody from Iraq. And this is what he did. He said, it is easier for Moses to take the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land than for you to go from Iraq to the United States. What a man of encouragement he was. (laughs) Forgetting about the point of the story. It wasn't Moses who did it, it was God who did it. And the same God is available to all of us. And then be patient with God. I'm telling you a story 40 years in the making. We all want things to happen instantaneously. It's it's like instant food when you go to Taco Bell or one of those places. With God, it might take 30, 40, 50 years. Who knows? Here's the most exciting thing I'm going to share with you. One day soon, there will be a table going from here to eternity. You could read about it in Isaiah 26. And Jesus will be at the head of that table. You will be there, I will be there. And Jesus personally will tell you how he made all things to work for good for you. I hardly could wait for that day. And then always be attentive to hear the voice of God. I heard the voice of God through the voice of the Greek Orthodox pastor, and I said yes to the Lord. And my life was changed. I know God is speaking to you today. I want to give you an opportunity. 
we're going to be singing, I surrender all. And as the Holy Spirit is moving on your heart, maybe you like to come to the front. Maybe you like to kneel down. In one way or another, just tell Jesus, he's the most important thing in your life. You love him more than anything else. That you will be faithful in walking with him always. So let's all stand up as we, as we sing the song and as God is moving on you, just come to the front. Please join in singing, I Surrender All. It's number 309 in the hymnal or the words are on the screen. wonderful song people always ask me is it really worth it to follow Jesus I want to tell you yes indeed people from all over the world from all throughout the ages add their testimony to mine and say yes indeed it is worth it to follow Jesus he's a wonderful Savior and a wonderful Lord uh, there is still time for you to come to the front it's really between you and God is to tell him he is the most important thing in your life. Make a new commitment, a new dedication of your life to him. Maybe even there's somebody here who have been drifting away. Just pray and ask God to rekindle the first love that you ever have had for him. As we continue to pray and God is moving on you, just come to the front.
sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation, glory, glory to His name. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we surrender everything to you. Our fears, our inadequacies, our problems, our lack of faith. And Lord, we are claiming the promise that you will come and dwell inside of us. Because you said, if we ask for the Spirit, you will send the Spirit to us. Lord, we claim the promise that he that is in us is infinitely greater than he that is in the world. Amen. And Lord, help us to stand faithful to you no matter what. There will be problems, temptations, difficulties, but you could help us to overcome. And Lord, maybe in a crowd like this, there are some who are discouraged. I pray that you will lift them up, that you will encourage them. Maybe some are drifting away, bring them back. Maybe some have lost hope. Help them to know that in you there is always a second chance. Yeah. Lord, we have many, many, many needs, but ultimately our greatest need is to have more of you. So come to our hearts and dwell inside of us. Give us more of your spirit, more of your joy, and more of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We invite all of you to stay for potluck, and immediately after that, I'm going to share with you how a prayer can change your life. And then at 6 o'clock, I'm going to share with you the story of the prodigal son from a Middle Eastern perspective. It will be something you never have heard before. It will be a story that uh, will thrill your heart and bring you closer to Jesus. Actually, uh, a man by the name of Kenneth Bailey spent 40 years, 40 plus years, studying this parable in the Middle East. So I'm going to share some of that inside with you. You will see the love of God in a wonderful way. Um, how about our young people? Why it is so difficult to be a Christian in the Middle East? Any volunteer? Go ahead. He, he got shy. Anyone else? Why it is so difficult to be a Christian in the Middle East? Go ahead. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Yes, and you, you saw that, you know, we are you know, seeing it more and more. In fact, many organizations are saying there are more persecution of Christians today than any other time in history. Uh, what happened to my mother? She got baptized, but you are not 15 years old. <laughs> so, so you don't deserve to eat two pieces of dessert. <laughs> Well, God bless you. Come and eat and then come back to hear more about how prayer can change your life.